pathway to forgiveness. It began when we started talking about how we share our stories, how we tell the story of what happened, how we get all the facts and the details out there. And then the second step is that we name the hurt. After we've told the story and you know all the details, why you're telling the story isn't just because of the story, it's because of how you feel. And until you know what the feeling is, until you know why you're experiencing what you're experiencing, you can't move into forgiveness. And so the third step is granting forgiveness. In the book by Desmond Tutu and his daughter, they tell the story of Kia Shu. And Kia was, works for one of the organizations, the Truth and Forgiveness Project. But at this time, she was in the United States and her daughter and husband decided to go on a meditation experience to Mumbai, India. And she did what you do when you're sending your people off to a foreign place that may be dangerous, right, Sean? <laughs> you say a few prayers, right? Um, she sent them off to this meditation experience, and she continued on with life and, and chatted now that we have the amazing technology that we have with them by FaceTiming and through emails. And she received a letter in the mail telling her daughter that she had scored the 95 percentile on the test so she could go to the school that she wanted to get into. And so she told her daughter that and chatted with her husband about what that meant. And she said, I love you, as the last word she spoke to her husband. But sometimes you can't control what happens after that I love you. She got on a plane because it was Thanksgiving and went down to her family in Florida where her parents and her son and other relatives were gathered. And when they were down there celebrating Thanksgiving, she received a call from the organization that they had gone on this meditation retreat with. And this organization told her to turn on the television and watch because the hotel that they were at had been attacked by terrorists and everybody was being held hostage. And so you can imagine she's glued to the television night and day, right? Refreshing her browser to see the latest news of what is happening in Mumbai, India, and she is in Florida. At a certain point, because they haven't told her anything about her husband and daughter. Her son sends pictures to the press to see if somebody can identify them. And then she got the call. The U.S. Embassy Consulate in India called to let her know that her husband and daughter had been killed in the in the restaurant at the hotel that very first day. And you do what you do when that news happens, right? You scream and you yell and you cry and you ask for things to change and you watch every bit of news you can about it. And then she sees on the news that they've resolved the situation and all but one of the terrorists are dead. And they flashed the picture of the last terrorist that is still alive. And as she's looking at that picture, as she's seeing that picture of this kid who had killed her family, she hears these words in her head. Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. 
And she says, as she's writing a description about this, that that was really weird for me to hear Jesus' words in my head because I'm not religious. I don't do that. And those words were there. But for her, she said, it changed something inside. It gave her the ability to move into acceptance. To accept that there was nothing that was going to change the fact that her husband and daughter were now dead. There was nothing that could bring them back to her. And those words, Father, forgive them, they know what that they do, started to settle inside her and bring her a sense of peace that she hadn't had before with all the news and trauma that was going on. And so she said to her family, we need to forgive them. And you can imagine the reaction that probably happened in the room at that moment. But for her, she says, what I realized looking at that picture is that his mother was also looking at that picture. His mother, who had held him as a child when he was pure and innocent and good and everything that is possible in a human being, had held him then and was grieving for him now. She says, I needed to forgive because it wasn't about him, it was about me. It was about learning to live with what I could not change. It was about letting go of all that pain so I could move forward. <coughs> Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Those are words that surround this book that Tutu and his daughter wrote, in which they share all these powerful stories of people who have suffered great hurts, great trauma. But that story of Jesus centers them. Because if you picture the life of Desmond Tutu, we started by telling the story of just an ordinary, everyday racist encounter that he had in his life all the time. But we know that those encounters get worse, that they get more dangerous, that people he cares about and ministers to are killed because of the apartheid system in South Africa. And yet, when that system falls, when it falls apart, he helps create a system to deal with the trauma in a way that will not harm the people who have been hurt the worst more than they've already been hurt. He creates a system where everybody tells their story, tells of the pain and trauma that they have experienced because of this government and this system that was set up to systematically oppress everybody who wasn't one of the Afrikaners, who wasn't white. And they tell their stories. Each side tells their stories. They tell the trauma that they inflicted. They tell the trauma they experienced. They share their pain and their hurt. They name those feelings. And because they are truthful with each other, because they share all that pain, they are able to start forgiving each other. But if we don't name the pain, if we don't name the trauma, if we don't share the stories, then it becomes harder to move to that spot of forgiveness. To hear those words that Jesus said while he is on the cross being killed for challenging the religious status quo, for challenging the empire and the way it treated people. 
as he is on the cross being taunted and reviled by people, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So Chichu says that forgiveness is something that requires practice. That it isn't as easy as it sounds sometimes. Because for her, it was sudden and quick. When Kia heard those words of Jesus in her head, it, pre it made her calm and peaceful. And it seemed like an, a very sudden and swift change of who and how she felt. But what Tutu says is it's also a learned experience. That if we can start by forgiving the little things, he says, take, for example, my children. If I hadn't learned how to forgive my children for all the things that happened along the way, especially those teenage years, if I hadn't been able to learn that forgiveness for them, would I be able to forgive the big thing that happened to me? The kid in the ice cream store who wouldn't serve me being disinvited from places because I was the wrong color, being treated as if I was not human. If I hadn't learned how to take that sassiness that my children threw at me and forgive them for their mistakes, those little bitty hurts along the way, it would have been harder for me to forgive the big hurts. And so he tells us that for each of us, it is possible to learn how to forgive. Even the most horrendous thing that you have experienced. And it just takes practice. It takes us learning to see that person in a different light. To know that the pain is still there because when Kia Shear tells her story. She says, it doesn't mean that I didn't want justice to happen for what he had done to my family and all the other people in the hotel that day. But it meant that he didn't control me anymore. That he deserved to go through a process of being held accountable for what his actions had caused. But I no longer needed to make him the hero of the story. I needed to see that I was the hero of my own story. That the villain didn't get to control what happened to me. That I could change and transform and learn to be the person that God created me to be. And Tutu also argues in this chapter that each of those people that you need to forgive were at one point that little baby that came into the world pure, beloved, and innocent. And if you can't forgive the current person, you can remember their mother who still loves them and grieves for them. You can remember that baby who had something happen along the way that transformed them. And when you let it go, when you are able to grant forgiveness, it changes you. And that's what is important. What Shear says is that I learned to see the word forgiving differently. I started breaking it apart into two words. Instead of it just being forgiving, it was forgiving. Meaning that I have now the ability to give to someone else. That my actions now have the ability to change and transform not just me, but the way I present to the world. Because she says, 
everybody asked every time they saw me, how could you? How could you forgive? How could you let what happened go? Because she had to in order to move forward or be stuck in that place. And so who is it that you need to forgive? Have you told the story, the details, the truth, the facts? Have you felt what it is that you're feeling? Have you made that pain, that hurt, that trauma? And then can you say those words? And you may have to say them a long time, over and over again for years. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen.